जय राध माधवा कुंज बिहारी जय राध माधवा कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन्नव शोदनंदन व्रज जन रंजन शोदनंदन व्रज जन रंजन यमुनतीरा वन चारी यमुनतीरा वन चारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन्नव जय गोपी जन्नव गिरीवर धारी यशोदनंदन व्रज जन रंजन यशोदनंदन व्रज जन रंजन यमुनतीरा वन चारी यमुनतीरा वन चारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन्नव गिरीवर धारी जय गोपी जन्नव गिरीवर धारी यशोदनंदन व्रज जन रंजन यशोदनंदन व्रज जन रंजन यमुनतीरा वन चारी यमुनतीरा वन चारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन्नव गिरीवर धारी जय गोपी जन्नव गिरीवर धारी यशोदनंदन व्रज जन रंजन यशोदनंदन व्रज जन रंजन यमुनतीरा वन चारी यमुनतीरा वन चारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन्नव गिरीवर धारी जय गोपी जन्नव गिरीवर धारी यशोदनंद
Yam Natira Vanachari Yam Natira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Jaya Gopi Janavalladha Giri Varadhari Jaya Gopi Janavalladha Giri Varadhari Yashodhanandana Vraja Janaranjana Yashodhanandana Vraja Janaranjana Yam Natira Vanachari Yamunatira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Sisi Radha Madhava Ki Jai Antara Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo Can you hold on one second because I don't want to forget something I have to just send a message Okay, all glories to Prahlad Maharaj, all glories to all the devotees of Krishna who are here today. Thank you, Tanya, for that kirtan. You are an opera star, no doubt. I was reading something this morning and I, then I got inspired to write and I wrote till about 9.10. This was 20 minutes before we're supposed to start. I had to finish writing because when you write and the thoughts in your head, I could forget it if I don't continue. So that's what I was doing. Hare Krishna. So, Tanya, where do we leave off? Okay. Hey, all glory to Prahlad Maharaj. All glory to all the devotees huh? of Krishna. About around 23 or something? Uh, so sorry, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, we left off... Uh, on 7, 10, 27. 27, okay. That was the last one we, we read. So what I'll do is I'll read the Sanskrit and that gives you time to copy and paste the English. So, Raisika, if you want to, if it's easier for you, it's 7, 10, 27. This is um, Lord Brahma speaking. Yo so lava varo mato Navadyo mama shishti vihi Tapo yoga balon nadha Samasta nigaman ahan Nadia was 
I was uh, going over your recording yesterday, trying to get it to sound good. I think I can speak Russian now. I was going to try to imitate it. Sanskrit's a lot easier, though, for, for me, anyway. I was going to try to give you back the recording and me speaking it in Russian so you could hear how it sounds on my microphone. <laughs> anyway, I like Sanskrit. The demon Hiranyakashipu received from me the benediction that he would not be killed by any living being within my creation. With this assurance and with strength derived from austerities and mystic power, he became excessively proud and transgressed all the Vedic injunctions. And you know, when you become proud, when someone becomes proud, sometimes they think they can do anything. And um, fortunately, we know that's not true, although we're not immune to pride. We're not immune to thinking we can do something that we're better than we are. So I have a very funny story. It's kind of embarrassing, but I, I'm gonna tell it anyway, because this happened long ago when I was a bona fide neophyte. And I don't know, you remember those movies? Um, now I'm a bona fide, uh, less than I was neophyte then, less neophyte. Um, those Rambo movies, the Rambo movies, I don't know, when did they come out, 1980s? Something like that. So, you know, I'm a devotee. I don't know who Rambo is. You know, I see, see posters or something, but I wasn't watching movies. And I don't know what happened, but somehow or other, I can't remember for the life of me. I think the first Rambo movie I saw was with a former ISKCON guru. This just shows if you're an ISKCON guru, don't watch Rambo movies because look what happens to you. But anyway, I'm not really a macho type guy, you know, although when I was a kid, I used to, you know, little, little kid, I used to fight like all little kids do. But when I was older, I wasn't the kind of guy who would, as you could probably tell, who would go up to someone and when I got mad at him, punch him in the face. But Rambo was that more of that character, you know, that fearless warrior. And the funniest thing happened to me, which definitely shows that Krishna has a sense of humor. So, um, I don't know, like I said, I don't know how I watched the movie. Maybe it was with this, maybe after I watched it, one with a sannyasi, and then I thought, with the guru, I thought, oh, I should watch more. Maybe there's something to learn from this. Anyway, it's like I, I, was, um, I was thinking, yeah, I need to be more like Rambo, you know, like Rough and Tough, because I don't think like that. You know, I don't walk down the street, you know, like, yeah, don't mess with me. It's not my nature. So the funniest thing happened, I was very influenced by that Rambo movie. And I was going, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'll am i also be like, I don't know, what was I thinking? I was thinking, um, yeah, I'm rough and tough like Rambo also, you know? And so I'm, I was chanting my rounds and I was walking down the beach, like thinking I'm like channeling Rambo. And right at that moment, two guys come and pull, my, pull me by the kurta to drag me into the ocean. I was walking, they were gonna drag me into the water. Like right when I was thinking like that, you know, it's like big, rough, tough Mahatma it was the funniest thing. Fortunately, there was another devotee who came running over who was like Rambo. And I think those guys were drunk, um, who was like Rambo and um, got rid of them. But it's like happened simultaneously. So, um, I never forgot that because it was like, it was such a lesson, you know, in, yeah, you think you're proud, you think you're an incarnation of Rambo, yeah, at least two drunk guys are going to drown you in the ocean, you know. <laughs> Krishna is amazing, you know, uh, sometimes we might uh, think he doesn't know what's going on, but indeed he does, for sure, Hare Krishna. Um, so why, why do we have these personalities in Bhagavatam, like Hiranyakashipu, who makes Rambo look like a total wimp? Is it Rambo? Was that was his name? Rambo, was it? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. 
Sounds like a Rambo, sounds like an elephant. Anyway, um, okay, you say, why do we have, why do we have these figures like Hiranyakashipu? Because, uh, well, you could say, well, because Krishna wanted to fight. So that's why you have Hiranyakashipu. But as we've discussed before, um, especially particularly in, the, in, in April, about Lord Ram, I was always telling everybody to study Hiranyakashipu to find out, uh, excuse me, to study Ravana, to find out the Ravana within. So, you know, you see Hiranyakashipu's pride and you think, oh, he was so puffed up, he was such a demon, such a rascal, such a this and that. And I'm like, like, and I'm perfect. I'm a sadhu, I'm a devotee. No, it's there. It's there for us to study. You can study. Okay, it's extreme, but sometimes you need extreme examples to make a point because if it's not extreme, you think, oh, it's not a problem. You know, I made offenses to devotee. I'm still here. You know, sometimes I'm proud, but, you know, I'm still here. So then you have stories in Bhagavatam where people make offenses who are not still here, like extreme. So, you know, just to make the point that don't take this too far because you could end up like Hiranyakashipu. And so, you know, he's he's a, a good figure for us to study because he it's always good to have examples of what not to do, not just what to do. Maybe sometimes it's easier to do not do something than to do something. So yeah. Um, just as Hiranyakashipu was, I think the way we could understand this is just as Hiranyakashipu was killed because of his pride and also because of his, um, the sins he committed against other living beings. If we mistreat others, if we become proud, we may not be killed directly by Lord and Shingadev, but it will definitely kill our spiritual life or it definitely disrupt it to one degree or another. So at least that much we can learn from Hiranyakashipu. <clears throat> the last thing um, that's said in this verse is because of his pride, he transgressed. He transgressed Vedic injunctions. So, you know, this pride, there's this pride, you know, we all had it when we were teenagers. And I guess for some of us, we, it never really left us. There's this pride of, um, I don't have to listen to anybody. I know everything. You ever think that way when you were like 16? My parents don't know anything. I know everything. Right? And then, you know, you take the knowledge of everything you know, and you end up like in a mess. And then you realize they probably know more than I did. But, but that takes you till you're like 24 to figure that out or something. If you've even figured it out yet, I don't even know if you figured it out yet, but that's what pride does. Like I, and as I've always said, um, the, the backup thought for pride is, if you're so smart, why are you still in the material world? Like, how come you haven't gotten out yet? Right, so that's always, you know, always the backup to keep us sober, you know. Not that we don't use our intelligence and, and not that we don't listen to our gut feelings and intuition. But at the same time, we recognize, yeah, I'm not that smart. If I was really smart, you know, it's like men are more intelligent than women. Oh, all you intelligent men, how intelligent are you? You're still in the material world, not that intelligent, I guess. If you were that intelligent, you wouldn't be a man. You'd be liberated. So, um. Yeah, like that. I'm so smart. Well, you're so smart. Why are you growing? I probably would say, how come you can't stop yourself from getting old? <clears throat> when those wrinkles come and the hair starts turning gray, what are you going to do then, smarty? Going to turn around the clocks? Yeah, you, you know, dye your hair and get an operation or I don't know. Stop eating salt, your gray hair will turn black, something. But <clears throat> you're still going to die sooner or later. <clears throat> so probably appeal to that intelligence. And then 
There's an interesting verse in the Gita, Yashastra Bidhi Mutsvija, Bhartate Kamakarata. Krishna explains why one doesn't follow Shastra, or one knows Shastra but doesn't follow it. Hirandikashipu knows Shastra. Just that's like so interesting. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Remind me if I forget. He knows Shastra and he's the biggest demon. Like that's a really interesting discussion. So Yashastra Bidhim. Utsri, utsrija means to give up, and Shastra Vidhi means the injunction of the Shastra, the Shastra Vidhi Mutsrija. Vartate Kamakarta. Um, why do you give up the injunction of Shastra, or why don't you follow it in the first place? Kamakarta. Kamakarta, Kama, you know, Kama means, but Kamakarta is translated as whimsy. And whimsy means you just feel like, whatever you feel like doing, you do it. That's whimsy. Just like, how come you're doing that? Because I feel like it. So what is the difference between a devotee and a non-devotee? A devotee follows Shastra. Why are you doing that? Because my guru told me. Because the Shastra says, that's a devotee, right? And non-devotee, why are you doing that? Because I feel like it. Why else do you think I would do it? Because it feels good. That's why I do it. Right, and that so then we lose, and then everybody nowadays is argue, have this whole argument about right and wrong is relative, and it's right for you, but it's not right for me, and we all make up our right and wrong, and there's no absolute truth because that supports whimsy. Because then, if there's no right and wrong, I'll just do whatever I feel like, and and because I feel like doing it, it's right for me, as long as it doesn't hurt you. But it does hurt you. It does hurt other people. They just don't realize it how it hurts other people. That's another thing. They don't realize it. Anyway, um, I think you all understand this, but Bhartate Kamakarta, and then Nasasiddin, Nasasiddin, Avapnoti, then you can't achieve perfection because it's just you and what you think is right. And if whatever you feel is right, you think that's going to liberate you from the material world, uh, it hasn't worked yet. If, it, if that's the way to get out of here, you would have been out of here long ago. Na sukam, na param gatim, and you won't be happy and you won't achieve the supreme param gatim. You won't achieve the goal of life. And you know, everybody wants to be happy by doing whatever they feel like it. And Krishna says, don't do whatever you feel like, follow the Shastra, then you'll be happy. And then we think, oh, Shastra is so restricting, you know, I'll be so miserable. Can't eat this, can't go here, got to do this at this time. That definitely proves we're stupid. But it's not our fault because we were educated to be stupid. So what can we do? You know, we've been we were trained in the universities to not think this way. Well, maybe it depends on the universe. Some universities are better than others, but um, I don't want to put down every class in every university, but general education is not. It's not, it's obviously it's not Shastric. And universities are the most liberal places on the, in the universe. So it's all about, you know, your individual, using your individual intelligence, which is great if you apply it to Shastra, but if you just apply it in general, you'll, you'll hit the target sometimes and you'll miss it sometimes. Like you, if you read philosophy, especially the ancient philosophers, they hit the target a lot somehow or other, but people were more pious then. People understood these things. People understood that whimsy is not good. So um, anyway, now, is that clear? Is that okay? Or do you have any arguments? Gorapriya is an academic. I hope I didn't offend you. <laughs> I, I define, I find there are many, many intelligent people out there, but they're just missing a few points. Right, and that few points kind of ruins their ruins their intelligence because because they they can't use it. You ever see these intelligent people and you think, oh, if he were a devotee, he would make the whole world Krishna conscious, but he's not. He's got he's logical, he's philosophical, he understands, uh, he thinks well, but is missing some some parts of the of the um, foundation to put the building together. Right. Maybe he's got the sides, but the foundation, you know, is missing. Yeah. So now let's look at Hiranyakashipu, his next lesson. The lesson, maybe we should write a book, The Lessons of Hiranyakashipu. Say, so what's this about? This is bogus, Prabhupada never said that.
Well, said it or not, there are lessons to be learned. So here, you I don't know if you know this story, but when Hiranyaksha, Hiranya, gold, Aksha eyes, when golden eyes was killed, or maybe he saw, you know, I think golden eyes, I, I mentioned before, to me, it means like a Vaisha. You, every, you see money everywhere, like everything is how to make money. You see gold everywhere, or you want gold. <clears throat> Something like that. So when Hiranyaksha was killed, everybody was upset, everybody was lamenting, and Hiranyaksha spoke. Basically, he spoke from the Vedas, but the Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita is called Gita Upanishad, and the Upanishads are, are the philosophical parts of the Vedas, and they talk about Brahman. I am Aham Brahmasmi, I'm not the body, I'm soul. So he explained, you know, don't lament, we're not the body, etc., etc. Now, just think about that. Think about that for a minute. The biggest demon ever to exist in the universe is speaking Bhagavad Gita philosophy. Like, that's like crazy, crazy mixed up, isn't it? Right? And, you know, and this Bhagavad Gita philosophy he's speaking. How much did he really understand? He understood theoretically. And he was, seems like he was just using it as a, as a tool to pacify everybody because he doesn't want to be surrounded by all kinds of miserable people. But did he follow it? Did he believe it? He wants to become the most powerful person in the universe and he's not the body. Some contradiction there. So one thing we can understand is you can know a lot and know nothing at the same time. And that was the man who knew everything, but knew nothing. That's Hiranyakashipu, right? I could say the same thing about Rav and all these demons. They weren't fools. They, the, the Prabhupada said that many of these Asura kings, they knew the Vedas well. But knowing them and imbibing them within your heart are completely two different things. So like you could know something and you don't even really have any inclination to connect with that in your life. And so that's what we see. You, you connect in your life with what you want to connect with, not necessarily what you know. There's one other thing I want to say, which is really important. I probably said it before in different ways. But this came up at the Japa retreat because a lot of devotees said they don't they don't have an emotional connection to Japa. They just have a duty, a connection of duty, which is, is true of many things in Krishna consciousness. We have a connection of duty, but the emotional connection is uh, the feeling that I want to do it, the feeling that I like it. We may not have that. So to have a duty connection. Is, is not bad, but it's a, it's a bit external because we, most of us will act on how we feel, not act on what we understand. The feeling always dominates the action, right? Generally. So if you want to imbibe knowledge, you have to, you, you're going to have to figure out how what you're learning becomes what you feel. And this is where we have this dichotomy between knowing something and not acting on it because I don't feel it, I just know it. And we all have that experience, right? And we even ask ourselves, why did you do that? You know that was wrong. Because I didn't feel it, that's the answer. I didn't feel like acting on it. I hadn't imbibed it enough uh, so there was no emotional connection to that knowledge. You know, it's like sometimes the devotee has this desire to do something and part of them says, it's probably not going to be good for my spiritual life, but they really want to do it. And so they're fighting with their head. You ever have that? The head and the heart are like battling. You know, no, I shouldn't do this, but I really want to. 
and probably better if I don't do it, you know, I, I can see my life will be better, but my heart really wants to. It's like, like we have to do that in Christian consciousness. We have to um, align, align that philosophy with what the heart wants to do, to develop an emotional connection. And there's ways to do that. One of the best ways to do it is to imagine playing out doing what your heart wants instead of, and then play out what your head wants. Then you'll see that you, they're gonna get two very different results. And playing, the more you play out the scenario of what's bad for you, generally the more you'll start connecting emotionally to what's good for you. Yeah, and there, there are other ways to do it. And you can, you can toy with this idea. How can I make what I'm learning what I'm feeling so that I want to, I want to do it. Like, do you want to be, we're not the body. Do you want to be a body? I think a lot of us want to be the body, right? Want to make it beautiful, look in the mirror, flex our muscles. So we know we're not the body, but too much we want to be it. I have to care for it. I'm not saying to look like a mess. And neglect yourself. <clears throat> but I think sometimes we actually want to be something our philosophy says we shouldn't want to be or we are not. And so it's good to be aware of it, right? In any way, in any way that you can understand something, philosophically, which creates an emotional connection, either of an attraction or a repulsion that is helpful in devotional service, then do it. Now let's take another example. Sometimes you have an intellectual, this is right, and the heart doesn't feel it, and then you're conflicted, and you're caught in between both. Then what happens? you'll start to feel bad that you want something that your head says you shouldn't want, right? Now, in some cases, there is a balance in between where you can, you can want that thing in a way that's not bad for you. So then you sometimes can make a balance, right? Right, I like to dress up. So I have these beautiful saris and, and bindis, then I put on gopi dots, and I've got these earrings like Radharani wear, shark earrings, and then I, you know, it's like I'm in a, and then I'm gonna go to some engagement, a TV show, and I'm gonna bamboozle them with my beauty. Okay, so then you, you know you're not the body, but you see the utility of dressing up, because you like to dress up, so you use it. That's okay. That's more of an alignment, right? right? But when we're not aligned, we, we live very conflicted lives. And it's, and it's kind of what I call spiritual psychosis, schizophrenia, not psychosis, spiritual schizophrenia, because we're like, we want to be this person, but we're this person. And when we're this person, we hate ourselves because we want to be that person. But you could combine both. But if you don't, you end up hating yourself for being the person you don't want to be because you idealize the other person. So why torture yourself? And, um, if you can't be the idealized person you want to be because you're not fully emotionally connected with it, then you blend it. So they can blend in something that's workable. It won't be detrimental for your devotional service and it won't make you feel schizophrenic one or the other. The one example of that is household life. You know, Prabhupada, Prabhupada had inter interesting experiences with Rehasta life. I don't know if you know this, but in, in Gaudiya Mat, Mat means it's an ashram, it's not a temple. I mean, it's a temple for us, but Mat means only Brahmacharis live there, no women. And so Srila Bhakti Siddhanta training brahmacharis, he didn't 
he would initiate grihastas, but he wasn't really involved in their life. So when Prabhupada came to America, he saw well, the culture is different because all the boys and girls mingle. Whereas in, in the culture he was raised in and the culture of Gaudiamat, they didn't mingle at all. It was like they never talked. I mean, if there was some service, maybe. Other than that, you know, most of the women in the temples were over 60. And the brahmacharis are young, so not, not a really an issue. But so he came to America and he saw in American culture, there's no discrimination. You have friends, boys have friends, are friends with girls, and it's not romantic. And, you know, and the boys, girls sit together. It's like they don't discriminate. So then, because of that, and, and so many of the um, devotees had boyfriends and girlfriends that weren't married, and Prabhupada said, well, you should get married. So then, as you may know, he started marrying couples, sometimes even choosing. And a lot of the women or men would come to him and say, I'd like to marry so-and-so. Then he would call so-and-so up, would you like to marry so-and-so? Yeah, so he was kind of becoming a bit of a matchmaker, and subsequently he was becoming, um, he was becoming a um, marriage counselor because after he made the match, you know what happens after a while, in a certain percentage of marriages, maybe you could say in all, but uh, not all have huge problems, but there are always problems that they were young and so they were coming to Prabhupada. And sometimes it's more complicated because when you're dealing with compatibility, Spirituality just adds another layer, layer of compatibility. So you may be very compatible materially and spiritually, you're not. So it just complicates it. So, um, and, you know, we're always hearing about renunciation and detachment, which like, if you're a Grihasta and you hear too much of that, it's like, and you're a young devotee, it's hard to make sense of it, right? It's like, I didn't, how, well, what does that mean? So, it was, um, so there were a problem, the Grihas was having problems. And, and at some point, Prabhupada stopped it. He said, if you want to get married, that's your choice, because he was approving, he was blessing. He said, I'm not going to bless any more marriages. I'm not a marriage counselor. Don't come to me with your marriage problems. So, um, what was my, I was making a point. I can't remember. The Bhakti Siddhanta. What was the point I was making before? I was saying Bhakti Siddhanta didn't get involved in marriages. Do you remember the point before that? I thought I was going somewhere with this and I lost track. We were talking about, um, I think we were talking, yeah, about the merging of the two angry hostile life was. Yeah, Magrasa life was an example, but uh, I think the point I was making is that Gaudiya Math, Bhakti Siddhanta didn't really do that. He just wanted strict renunciation. But anyway, Prabhupada saw that we couldn't do that. So, you know, this conundrum, I want to be renounced, but I don't have the samskars for it. So then, Grihasta Ashram is meant to be a combined both so that you won't be the schizophrenic personality. And it, it, this is just one example. It doesn't have to be Grihastha Ashram. Uh, I'm gonna read some of the comments because it's like, there's a lot of them. So I must have, this must have struck an accord with somebody or many, many buddies. Okay. Tanya says, in one lecture, His Holiness Bhakti Vidyapurna Maharaj stated that according to Shastra, we get so much more out of life because it assures our welfare on all levels, physical, the emotion, and the intellectual. That makes so much sense. Well, I was reading a letter this morning <clears throat> and Prabhupada was saying, if we're not comfortable, it will impede our spiritual life. So what does comfortable mean? Then you're thinking, oh, I can go out and get that Mercedes Benz because it's really comfortable. And I'm gonna buy that $2,000 sofa because it's really comfortable. Not exactly that. 
But as we've discussed many times before, Prabhupada could see, he basically he's saying, if you deprive yourself too much of what you need, then you'll be thinking about it all the time. So you'll be, no, actually what Prabhupada said is, um, you'll be materially hankering for something if you need it, if you don't have it. Now, if you're actually renounced, you wouldn't, right? Why would you hanker for it if you don't want it in the first place? But if you're artificially trying to renounce it and you're not ready, then you'll hanker for it. So therefore, you should live comfortably. And Prabhupada also said in Krishna book and other places, you should be peaceful. And so what does it mean to be peaceful? I think we talked about that on Monday. This is basically what Prabhupada meant by being peaceful. Have enough that you don't go crazy. Like, right. So live comfortably, but not so comfortably that you forget Krishna. Live austerely, but not so austerely that you forget Krishna. Because it said, Dridra Sarva Nasa Nasha. I forget the verse, but it says poverty can be very degrading because the poor man is always hankering. So instead of being able to execute spiritual life, they're always hankering because they don't have enough. I want this, I want that, I need this, I need that. And you know, sometimes when you're hankering for something, whether it's food or an object that you don't need and you can't stop thinking about it, sometimes you just buy it and you tell yourself, I know I don't even need it, but if I don't buy it, I'm gonna, I'll be you know, searching on Amazon when I should be reading Bhagavatam. So I'll just buy it, you know. Then you can buy it and then have buyer's remorse and then send it back, whatever. But um, it's, just, it's just an observation of, of a reality that there has to be a certain level of what Prabhupada called comfort. And he also called it peace of mind so that now you can execute Christian consciousness. Now, if you take somebody who by nature is renounced and you give them comfort, that makes them uncomfortable. Right? And if you give that person austerity, that makes them comfortable. Like they're in anxiety unless they're doing lots of austerity. The austerity is their happiness. So you can look at it in either way. The, the, I, feel, I feel very uncomfortable, why? Because there's not enough austerity in my life. I like austerity, I need it, I want it. So whatever your comfort marker is, so that you'll be peaceful, so that you can execute devotional service, that's the important thing. Because we're getting purified by the bhakti, our level of renunciation, if it's within a certain continuum, if it's a little higher or lower, it's not really such a problem. Ambarish Maharaj had a lot, not really a problem. But the internal renunciation, if that's not there, that's a problem. So if you have a little more so that you can be now renounced, because, okay, I have enough now. But if I don't have enough, I'm thinking, I'm hankering. It's not good for your spiritual life. I have enough. Now I can peacefully sit in my beautiful temple with my beautiful deities and chant amazing rounds, which will ultimately give me love of Krishna, which will then ultimately cause me to be renounced from everything in the universe, right? So that's always, that's important criteria, right? Like, like what is this situation in which uh, my bhakti will be helped the most? So when they get married and, and someone will say, well, Prabhu, that's a fall down. You fell down. That's one way of looking at it. But another way of looking at it is, well, I just fell on the ground, so now I can walk because I was trying to walk above the ground and I didn't have stability. So now this is better. Now I can do my service. If, if that's what happens, sometimes you get married and it's like you just entered a storm on sea and the ship is rocking. That's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about doing it properly. So if you do it properly and it's stable, now you can stably do your bhakti. And that's the thing that's going to help you. So whether you have a one bedroom apartment or a three bedroom house, you know, whether you have a, an SUV, a van, a 2022, a 2018, a 27, I drive a 2001 Toyota Corolla. I'm more advanced than you because you drive a 2022 Toyota Vensa van or something, or whatever it's called. No, that, that, would, that would be stupid to say that. It could be true. 
but not necessarily. So, um, so I was just talk just to remind you what I was saying. We were talking about these two opposites and how we want to create emotional connection to this. This is the goal. This is what we want. This hand right here, that's the goal. And this is how we feel. And we want to get the feeling. So they merge. But sometimes we don't get the feeling because this goal is too high. So you can't feel it. It's like, it's too artificial. So then you have to bring them together, combine them into one, because it's now it's not one or the, one or the other. Um, well, if it's if this other, you don't want it, because that's, um, well, no, that, that's the emotion, that's good. If it's only intellectual, it's not going to help because there's no emotion. So then by combining them, you will be able to then, oh, I can feel this. I can't, I can't relate to Brahmacharya life, but Grihastra life, I can feel I can do that. Okay, so then you do it. And then when you become a Grihastha, because you still value renunciation, you do your fasting on Akadasi and all the holy days, you know, you get up early, you chant, you read. It doesn't mean that all that austerity and all that, that does, you give that up. No, but certain austerities you're not able to do, or you're better able to do austerities in that environment, you feel more comfortable, or you need that independence, whatever it is, it's meant to create a foundation so you do your bhakti better, and that's what's going to purify you. Because just, just being celibate and brahmachari, that's, in and of itself, there's lots of brahmacharis in India, but it's to facilitate bhakti. So if that's what facilitates your bhakti best, do it, by all means. Prabhupada said it's simpler. There's no entanglement. If one doesn't need it, one doesn't need it. And if one doesn't need it, one doesn't need it. So why should one do something they don't need if it's just, if it's, if it's you can say, a gamble. There's no, there's no reason for it. Now, sometimes one may one may have this goal of renunciation, but they're not they're not uh, qualified, but they're adverse to let's say to grihastha life. But if you're not qualified for renunciation, then your inversion to something is artificial. It's aversion, it's not renunciation. Because if you're actually qualified, you'll be renounced. If you're not qualified, you're just repulsing the idea because you don't like it, but the repulsion is the other side of the coin of attraction, which should indicate if I'm repulsed, I'm attracted. Those Matajis, just a bag of stool. Yeah, that's the first guy to get married in the temple. If you if you ever want to bet, but we, we're not allowed to bet. You can bet Gulab Jamans or something. Well, if you want to bet who's the next Brahmachari to get married, it's that one. I'll bet you three Gulabs, Prabhu. He's the next one. Right? We've How many times have we seen that? Like six, 67,000 in it. Yeah. For every man that's married, we, no, no, I can't say every man. Not every man does that, but you understand, right? Have you seen it before? Krishna Premi is going, I'm seeing it everywhere around me at every moment. Yeah. So, um, I'm not saying calling any names. This is just a kind of universal reality. So aversion is the other side of attraction. So we should be aware of that. Anything you're extremely adverse to, you're attracted to. And the nature of the mind is that whatever you're adverse to, you think about. Whatever you're afraid of, you think about. Whatever you tell your mind not to think about, hello, you're thinking about it. Okay, she didn't notice. Don't think about that. Don't think about what? Women. Don't think about women. Okay, I won't think about women. What should I not think about? Women. Okay, we're not going to think about women, all right? No, we're not going to think about women. What have you been thinking about for the last minute? Uh, women, right? That's Bhakta Bozo and Bhakta Burfi. That's a skit from Bhakta Bozo and Bhakta Burfi. Don't think of women. Yeah, we shouldn't think of women. Yeah, that, that, that. mucus bilayer. Yeah, those women, this women, that. Yeah. So funny, right? Bhakta Bozo meets Bhakta Burfi.
I don't know. Maybe after I die, someone's going to listen to all these classes and get all the scripts for Bakta Bozo and Bakta Burfi movies. And then, you know, at least give me credit if you do. And if you make a lot of money, send it to my family. Send it to Satwa Life to support our preaching. <laughs> the Adventures of Bakta Bozo with special guest star Bakta Burfi. <laughs> Okay, so that's my comment on that. And we have a comment from Gora Priya. How not to be the body when we live in a society that validates on the basis of the body and good personal presentation and beauty, even to preach in certain socially higher social environments. The initial validation is based on clothing. Oh, I can tell you how to do this, I do it all the time. If not, people do not listen to you. For example, preaching in a high society universe requires first show, yeah. Do you ever see me in my uh, suit and tie in China? Not, I don't have a tie, but the devotees in China went out. They have in China, they, you know, so many clothes are made in China, so they have all the name brands. It's like an outlet mall. And I was doing some corporate programs, so they had to dick me out in the latest and greatest. They should have seen me. I was styling Gora Priya like big time. I have two, or I think two sets are still in China. I have one set here, comes in handy sometimes. There's a picture of me wearing a white suit jacket to playing Kirtan. I don't know if you've seen that, that was in China. It's like a linen suit jacket. I was, yeah. We, um, we did that for Sankirtan for many years we would go out in what we would call karmi clothes. There's actually no such thing as karmi clothes because karmi means one who is creating karma. So there's no clothes that you put on that would cause you to create karma that I'm aware of. And if there is, then we should find the clothes that cause you to give up karma, to eradicate karma. Those would be called the akarmi clothes. I don't want to wear karmi clothes. I want to wear a karmi clothes, no karma clothes. Um, sometimes later we call them street clothes. I don't know. I, I think that's an ISKCON word, right? Street clothes. Or I guess if you're in the military, maybe street clothes. Um, civilian clothes. Oh, civilian clothes, right? <clears throat> when we wear our civilian clothes, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, you know the word in English, Corbria, schlump? You know that word, schlump? <clears throat> schlump is like how most men look when, they don't, when they're not married. <laughs> Unless they're trying to attract a woman, they won't look like a schlump. But ordinarily, if they're just together, they kind of look like schlumps. Which means like they'll wear like a dirty t-shirt with a hole in it and pants that don't fit. Um, I like that. That's a schlump, you know. Toshan knows what it's like to be a schlump. Yeah. So most men know. Although, although Nirmal Chandra, he likes to dress up. Some men, you know, they have that sense. You know, look nice. Um. So yes, what you say is true. If you, if oh, I'll tell you a story. You know, in Italy, like when I go to Italy. I go and visit Tradas Prabhu, my friend, and he's, he's like, look, you have to dress nice here. This is Italy. It's like, they're not, if you're not dressed, as they say in England, dressed to your nines, they like don't respect you. So, you know, like, you know, I can't go like this to Italy. This is too schlumpy, you know, a t-shirt and a chatter. I look like a hippie. So, um, so I, first time I went to Italy was, 1986, and every devotee had the same shoes, the same dhoti, the same korta, the same sweater, the same hat. It was like, and all the grihastas were like, whoa. And they had wool over, because it's in the winter it's cold, they all had wool overcoats down to their knees, like beautiful, you know, Italy. I have a wool coat from Italy. I hardly ever wear because I feel like it's so, uh, What's the word I'm looking when you dress up too much? I can't think of the word. Ostentatious, there's another word. It's not my nature, you know, I don't like to 
show off, but it's like when I wear this, everyone's like, woohoo, cool. Where'd you get that? You know, that's really nice. I've only worn it about six times. It's so nice. I'm embarrassed. But if I go to Italy, that's what I wear because that's how they'll judge you. You've got to look that way. So, yes. And if I'm invited to a wedding of the president of the United States, his daughter or something, yeah. So, of course. But um, there is a principle behind this. In, in, um, the principle is moderation. But for service, we can go either way. You know, go to the yoga studio. Like I'm dressed for the yoga studio right now. If I if I dress up in a suit, you know, they're like, who's this guy? We don't want to hear from him. So you have to you have to adjust to your audience, right? So yes, we should look nice, present ourselves nice for sure. So that's that's the point. You're using that propensity to look nice in Krishna service. And Gaurapriya, if all the girls look like schlumps, no men will join this time, just as a side point. So you are actually attracting people to Krishna consciousness by looking nice, whether you know it or not. And if you all look like schlumps, you'll only attract schlumps. My godbrother, Kala Kantaprabhu, is making more devotees in America than anybody. I said, what's your secret? He said, you have to have women in the ashram, otherwise the men don't join. He was dead serious. You know, it sounds like a joke. He said, no, he's dead serious. He said, I, it's my experience. So, um, you know, because um, women dressing nicely adds vibrancy and color. Otherwise, it's all like saffron, just like blah. The whole temple is blah. But that's temples are different. Mat, all saffron, it's yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. But, you know, if there's no beautiful women around, what men are going to join? They'll all go home. Just a bunch of saffron blah. Unless there are men who want to be monks, yeah, then they'll all join. It'll attract them. It'll attract all the monks. But there's not that many. In India, there's many men who want to be brahmachari, but in America, it's becoming a little more popular now, being a monk for a few years or something. But... Monk for life? I don't know. So um, it's all about how to utilize your propensity so it doesn't get the best of you and you can use it in preaching and then be detached. So for me, dressing up is total detachment. Like, you know, I'll walk out and you go, you look so good. Yeah, I look fantastic and I feel like an idiot dressed like this. I haven't dressed this way in 50 years. You know? so it's like, these are the people I was trying not to be. I became a hippie to get rid of this stuff. And now I'm dressed like them. Ah! But I know that'll be good for the preaching. So I do it. That's detachment. And maybe you're doing a program at a yoga center. So you just go there in a t-shirt, no makeup, and just look really all natural. Because that's the best. <laughs> and if you come out all decked up, they go, what kind of yogi is this? What kind of yogini is this? You know? I don't know. Maybe they'll like it, maybe they won't. I'm just speaking, you know, just just to give an idea of the other side. But you understand the principle, right? Is that okay, Gorpri? Yeah. If you're going to go out and preach to the hippies, you got to be natural, right? Got to be down to earth, you know. Just get some red earth and that's your makeup. You know? Red earth. Rosy cheeks, you're good to go. Uh, the, 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 you know, traditionally that red brick was made from earth or that red earth, you, you know, red earth, terre rouge, that's French. How do you say it in Spanish? Same. Rojo, terre rojo, terre rojo. rojo. Yeah. But you know, that red earth. So they would take that red earth and mix with water and boil their clothes in it. And that's the saffron color. And that kept away, apparently, snakes or insects or both. So, you know, natural living, nice. Nadia, when there was an explosion of a nuclear power station in the Soviet Union, all food was poisoned with radiation, but devotees still offered everything to Krishna. Uh, the prasadam was checked, and to everyone's surprise, there's no poison in prasadam at all. Who checked it? 
That's unbelievable. Who checked it? Wow. You know, Nadia, I have a story for you. This reminds me. There was a lady, I think, in, we met a lady once. This was like 27 years ago, 26 years ago. We went out, myself, my wife from Los Angeles and another devotee to do a show in, I think, Tucson, Arizona. And the devotee said, there's this naturopathic doctor, like really, I don't know, kind of famous. And she was helping a lot of devotees. So we went to see her and she kind of looks at you and tells you what's wrong by looking at you. And I, um, she does some kind of testing, frequency testing on food to see how it is. And she said, your food is really unhealthy, but because it's offered, it has high frequency. So it tests like healthy, high frequency food, even though the food itself, like a potato or something, normally tests low or sugar tests low. So that would validate what you're saying. Although, ladies and gentlemen, um, I don't recommend eating radiated food unless it's first offered and tested. I don't even know. Offering radiated food to Krishna, I guess you don't have a choice, right? And then next week, we find out all the devotees are in the hospital. I go, that radiation machine was bogus. You know, just, just be careful. That's all I can say. And I've been more scared. I actually have a picture of Lord Nishing Devdita, and we all to always offer him some flowers. You should stop doing that. No. Um, scared of offending him or being bogus? Um, uh, yeah, Guru Maharaj, these are actually the questions and comments from the um, Monday class because you oh, didn't oh, answer. Oh, oh, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. So Tanya sent just them to the chat. Oh, okay, okay. So it's not yeah. about this class. Sorry okay. for the confusion. Scared of Nishinga Dev, yeah. Don't be afraid. Gorapriya, I often ask Lord Nishinga Dev for protection when I go to feed abandoned animals. These places are generally abandoned, dirty, very lonely. Sometimes there are people who could be dangerous. Sometimes I'm afraid to do it. So I always pray to Lord Nishinga Dev. P is back in action. She was quite busy for a while. Now she's back. Thank you, P, for coming. Regarding Pi, P, P, yeah, P, for all the way from Sweden. She zoomed in all the way from Sweden. Regarding what you said about parents becoming devotees, if we are, does that mean that no matter how they live their lives? Yeah. It only matters how you live your life. Um, and then I mentioned, P, that... Um, not only your parents, but seven generations, but if you're more pure, it can go up to 21 generations. So, you know, it's nice, nice meditation to think um, becoming pure is what it's all about. That's the goal of life is to become pure. So just do it, okay? Uh, yeah, all benefit will come to you and everyone if you become pure. This one is new from John of Maine. Yogi John says, Jesuit universities used to require six credits in philosophy and six in theology for a BA degree in order to encourage critical thinking. Yeah, activate their brains. Maybe they still do. There, you know, what's his name? That guy, Jordan Peterson, he... He said he was going to open a purely liberal arts college and he was going to make it free. I don't know if it's online or what. Because he said people don't know how to think and that was the purpose of liberal arts education to get you to your brain to think, which would help. You know, um, you ever see something and you ask the question, of course, I know the answer is yes. What were they thinking? To which I always answer, they weren't thinking, because if they were, they wouldn't have done it, right? What were they thinking? Nothing. Or some evil thought. Um, yeah. That's why we have Prabhupada's books to help us think. That's our six credits in theology. 
philosophy. It's really cool, John, if you, if you um, go to a temple and get to meet young kids who are in Gurukul, they're total philosophers. They, they can, you know, like out philosophize, you know, university professors. Because that's how they were trained to think from the time they grew up. It's interesting experiment, right? How do, how do kids think who grew up thinking philosophically? Krishna Prem says, a question from Ishwar Madhava, how to differentiate if you should fulfill your material desire, if you should overcome it, because we have so many desires, yeah. Um, you, you know, it would depend on the desire, so I can give a generic answer. Um, I think we already answered it partially. If you're, if you're obsessed with it, um, obsessed with aversion to it, if you can't stop thinking about it, if it's actually degrading you. It's kind of like asking the question, how do I know when I should go to the doctor? Well, you can't heal it any other way. You need to go to the doctor. So you try to transcend it, you try to heal it, you try to purify it, you do everything, chant it away, Srimad Bhagavatam it away, Tosi Puja it away, Raskula it away, Sangha it away, and there it is, it's still staring in the face, then it's derailing your spiritual life. You can't ignore it anymore. You've got to deal with it. And so I don't I don't think that's hard to understand, but what can be hard to understand or what can be difficult, every time I would say, that's hard to understand, my father would say, it's difficult, not hard. He didn't like that word. At least I guess in his generation, you don't say it's hard to do this. You say the desk is hard. It's difficult to do this. So English lesson, I don't know if that's current, but anyway, so, um, You know, what do you do with a disease you can't get rid of and you can't manage because it's handicapping you? Then you go to the doctor and figure it out or do something, right? Get online and start researching what to do. And if you're able to, you know, say, well, maybe I'll just, you know, the disease is coming, something's, you know, you say, maybe I'll just, I just need to exercise more. And you exercise more and it's fine, it's gone. All right, it's gone. So then those, that's not a worry. So as long as, as long as it's becoming problematic for your spiritual life and you're doing everything you can to rid yourself of it and it's not working, you'll have to face it. So I remember the point I was making was the problem is sometimes we don't even know what the problem is. That's that's like there's some kind of denial or we don't, you know, it's like I don't want to admit I have this problem because if I do, I'll just become full of guilt or shame or depressed or whatever and I'd rather not think about it. So sometimes that's the problem. You have it and you don't want to acknowledge it. But anytime there's a problem in your spiritual life, try to trace back to what you think is causing it. And then deal with it. And how to deal with it, it'll be different for different people. Sometimes the same for everyone. It's nice to discuss with other devotees. I have this problem. How should I deal with it? I, I'm attached to this or that. What should I do? Um, can't stop thinking about it. So sometimes those are some immediate signs, you know, should I do this or shouldn't I do that? Well, what's going on for you? Well, I'm always thinking about this all the time. Well, if you're always thinking about it and you can't stop thinking about it, then you're going to have to deal with it. And so then the next point is, well, how do you deal with it? Because how you deal with it is crucial because if you don't deal with it properly, it will get the best of you. So, you know, in our philosophy, having the desire is not the worst thing in the world. How you deal with it is more crucial because having it is not always under your control. It's just there, but how do you deal with it? No, you can't always blame yourself for having a desire. I mean, you could, because you could be praying more to overcome it and you could be doing things to overcome it. But sometimes in spite of praying, in spite of doing everything, you still have it, right? So you can't blame yourself. It's just, it is, it is what it is. And so at that point to deny what is, is not healthy because then it affects you and you don't do anything about it. Correct. 
Um, and then it depends what you mean by fulfilling material desire, because we don't, we mean fulfilling it in a way that actually helps you advance, not just fulfilling it. You, know? you don't want to fulfill it in a way that's not good for you. So you have to figure out how to fulfill it in a way that's good for me. And sometimes what I've seen, it's just really, really sad, devotees are lamenting about their material desires when in fact they're not even material desires. They're actually spiritual desires, which are not 100% pure, and they think they're material desires. So that, that's sad if you think that way. Like I have this desire, you know, have this material desire to go to Vrindavan and Karti. That's not a material desire. I have a material desire to go fly to Alachua, see my guru, you know, I'm so selfish, you know. Maybe you're selfish, I don't know, but it's not like material desire in and of itself. I mean, it could be a whimsical desire. You have three kids, and you're going to leave them starving for a week, yeah. But you get my point that a lot of times we think, oh, I'm so bad, I have this desire. It's like, it's like saying, I'm so bad because you know, I had the desire to eat breakfast this morning. If I was more advanced, I wouldn't. That, that makes absolutely no sense. And we know it makes no sense. But we have other desires that I feel are similar to that, that also don't make no sense, but they make sense to us. And then we think we're bad. And it's, uh, yeah. I was talking to a devotee yesterday, how she's uh, this devotee named Jiva who's doing the Bhakti recovery. And I said, uh, do you feel from your experience that after someone becomes a, we're going to do a talk with the Bhakti recovery group on self-acceptance. So I said, do you feel after someone becomes a devotee, self-acceptance is more difficult? I said, oh yeah. Because, you know, before you're a devotee, you're not, there's no real, you know, what are you comparing yourself to? Most of us gave up our religion anyway, or fell asleep in church. So we don't even know what it's teaching, you know, or we didn't care what it's teaching. But when you come to Krishna consciousness, you know what it's teaching and you care what it's teaching. And you want to be like that. I can't say every one of you was not a guilty Catholic or Baptist or whatever. There's plenty of those kinds of people out there as well. But it's kind of a natural phenomena when you you don't you have less not to like about yourself before you're a devotee because you know you're just like everybody else just normal now you're not supposed to be like everybody else now you have more not to like about yourself but when you're like everybody else nobody's that great you know so if you compare yourself to everybody well at least i don't go to the bar and i'm married to one person well that puts me like a the top two percentile of the universe you know so <sighs> And that's just kind of normal, right? Normal life. Um, so now you have, you're a devotee and you've got these other standards and you start to feel guilty and shameful. So that's what I see in like, oh, I have these material desires. They're not material desires. What are you talking about? They're just desires, you know? What, what they mean is like, well, I want to do it for Krishna. That's a material desire. It's not actually a material desire. You want to do it for Krishna. As long as you put the Krishna in, it's not material. Might be a little selfish. Yeah, of course. And it might not even be. You just might think it is. So that's a long answer to you, Ishwar Manava. And I hope it answered your question as best I can without knowing your personal situation. Bharat Bell says, does that mean if I don't imbibe the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam, am I activating Ravana Hanyakashi Hashi, in me? Um, the potential, it means potentially. You're not, if we're not following Bhagavad Gita, then what's our defense force for the Ravana and Hiranyakashi that could attack us? Mm. What, how else are we going to purify it? Well, we could say just chant, but chanting is also imbibing Bhagavad Gita. Sadhana is also imbibing Bhagavad Gita, right? Correct. TK, TK, Bharat. Acha, Bharat says, Acha, 
अच्छा है अच्छा है सत्यम है सत्यम इट इज ट्रू एनी वे वट आई वुड सजेस्ट यू भारत is to be frightened by the ravana and aranyakashipu within you be afraid of them don't let them out of their cage keep them locked up just feed them and tell them be quiet don't bother me not actually feed them better starve them yeah don't feed them excuse me that was a mistake pause the tape erase that starve them starve the aranyakashipu and ravana within you and they're they have a ravenous appetite starve them so they just die because if you feed them they're going to get you they're going to attack you right so the title of this class is don't feed the ravana don't feed the hiranyakashipu inside ravana sounds better for child don't feel feed the ravana within or today's question is did you feed the ravana within and if so what did you feed him and everyone's like we're going to have our own 12 step meeting you know mm. i must confess today i fed my ravana this you know youtube binge watching today i must confess that i fed my ravana prasadam eight times every 2 hours and only gulab jamuns Today I must confess I fed my Ravana envy of my best friend who just graduated with a with a great average I couldn't dream of ever having you know so don't feed the Ravana within you cuz when that Ravana gets strong he's going to break out of the cage and destroy your life right if he hasn't already looks like you're doing okay you've keep you're keeping him locked up so that's the process of krishna consciousness you know in bhagavad gita end of the third chapter krishna says by intelligence you will control yourself by intelligence so you have to be intelligent bart to keep the cage locked and rava is going to go over that cage or i'll kill you hanji tike uh over that cage or i'll kill you ah and you're like and then the impulse comes i got to do this i have to do this i can't stop myself if i don't do it robin i won't be happy don't listen to him don't believe him tell him i'll feed you tomorrow i'll feed you later and every time he screams i'll feed you later um this is a great tactic i've heard like whenever you have an impulse just tell yourself uh not now we'll do it later not now we'll do it later not now we'll just keep putting it off you know till you're too tired to do it and it's the end of the night and just go to sleep or well, made it through that day yeah and that was ravana's instruction such a beautiful instruction if something is bad put it off if something is good do it and and we do the opposite if it's bad let's do it now it's good and manana 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 my new hit song tomorrow never comes what have you put off for tomorrow right to ma because tomorrow never comes manana never comes right do what you don't want to do do what you don't want to do got a weird animal outside hope it's not a skunk do immediately what you don't want to do don't put off today for don't put off for tomorrow what you could do today cuz tomorrow never comes don't trust your future self your future self never comes yeah so it's such a good instruction if it's auspicious do it now if it's inauspicious put it off put it off so any any time ravana is screaming just go cool ravana catch you later you know i'll be back soon put it off put it off and feed the prahlad within you starve oh that's the title right starve the ravana within feed the prahlad within that's it krishna con what is krishna consciousness in a nutshell it's to feed the prahlad within and to starve the ravana within 
That's it. Hare Krishna. Good or great? <laughs> bueno or, or fantastico? Grande or grande? Bueno or bueno? Fantastico or fantastico? Yeah. So simple, isn't it? Uh. Yeah, but I'm not famous for short answers, as you may have noticed. You know why I can't give short answers? Because I have an active brain and it thinks about all these things. Well, that's not a good answer, but that's one answer. Probably the real reason is, is I don't have a short answer. That's probably the reason, right? <laughs> If you know something really well, you just give one line and it answers it all. I have to give like 48 lines. Uh, but maybe next time when you ask, I can do it in 24 lines. And then each successive time, 12, 6. Get it down to like 3. Okay. So we'll go back and read. I'll read text 28. Lord Brahma speaking. Dishyatat. Tanaya Shadhur Mahabhagavator Bakaha Twaya Vimot Shito Brtior Prishatam Samito Dhuna. By great fortune, Hiranyakashipu's son, Prahlad Maharaj, has now been released from death. For although he is a child, he is an exalted devotee. Now he is fully under the protection of your lotus feet. Release from death means there's no, his father was perpetually trying to kill him. You know, you, you read in the Bhagavatam, it's like, you know, I don't know, there were eight ways that he tried to kill him. This is more ways that he, it was just perpetually going on, trying to kill him. And he would try each tactic for like days. You know, elephants for days, snakes for days, hot oil for days, like nothing was working. So he's, he's just perpetually trying to um, kill him. So he's released from death because his father has died. Right? That's it. No more fear. Um, hmm. And he's telling Lord Nishani Dave. He has totally, he is totally under your shelter. You know, the word sharanam, as we've said before, translated as surrender in 1866 of the Gita, also means sharana, sharanam means surrender. Uh, excuse me, it means shelter also, to take shelter. So surrender, surrender, in the positive, you know, the surrender means giving up. That's how we see it. But the other side of surrender is to be given the shelter and protection. So it's nice to see sharanam as being given something rather than giving up something. But until you give up something, you won't get it because if your hands are full, I can't put anything in your hand. So surrender what's in your hands, a bunch of junk anyway, and then I can put in all the diamonds and the jewels. Oh, here's my hands. Surrender all your junk, then Krishna can fill it up with diamonds and jewels. Sharanam. Take shelter, and then he'll give you. Correct? So shelter, so that way sharanam is very positive. You're you're once you get shelter, then you're given so much. But when you're going in this structure to get your shelter, you can't, they're not gonna let you take anything in. You have to leave that all at the door. Then you come in and we'll give you everything. That's the idea. You know, small payment. You you drop a little junk and you get giant diamonds and pearls and valuable jewels. Okay, so let's go to the next verse. <clears throat> this is verse 29. 
We can't go to the next verse. It's 11 o'clock. Party is over. Hare Krishna. Well, that went by really fast. That's because I started late. Yeah, that explains it. Hare Krishna. Time flies when you're telling jokes, isn't it? <laughs>